Good morning, reformers. Hope everybody's having a great uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, today we're going to talk about a little bit of a different topic or subject. Uh, I've got with me Angelo, who's with uh, Leader One Financial. If you don't know him, he's one of our preferred vendors here that's going to be doing some, uh, you know, of course, retail loans, investment loans, anything your, your, any kind of products your clients need. Uh, but we're going to talk today a little bit about a, a very cool acronym. It's called ICE. And uh, Angelo's going to talk a little bit more in detail about it. But I wanted to talk about the subject because Obviously, as a real estate agent and as you know, working with a lender, you know, we don't always want to send our lenders, you know, just a bunch of junk leads. You know, people that we think may or may not qualify. You know, of course, we don't know exactly, you know, what you guys are always going to be looking for. At least we do have an understanding or an idea. But you know, we can't, of course, do all the underwriting like you guys do. But we can at least ask some questions that you know are going to procure uh, what this ICE acronym goes over, and so that way you kind of get an understanding of. You know, is this something that I should send to Angelo? Is it something that this guy is, you know, just totally unqualified for that probably won't work? And so uh, we're going to go into a little bit more of those details. But uh, first of all, you know, Angelo, uh, just tell the, the audience, you know, they don't know, just a little quick background on yourself. Uh, and then kind of go into uh, the, uh, the acronym ICE, which is really interesting, guys, and that uh, just kind of tells a little bit of uh, explanation on it. Oh, uh, yeah, you're uh, happy to. Again, Vance, thanks for the uh, uh, pleasant introduction there. And uh, just to let you guys know my background, of course, I was a military brat. Dad was in the Air Force, uh, retired, uh, made a career out of it. Uh, I did not want to go that route, ended up uh, joining the military as well. Uh, and, uh, spent 13 years active duty doing that, 19 years plus uh, in the financial uh, business uh, as a mortgage banker. And enjoyed it uh, as I speak today. It's a great, uh, great opportunity here in the Metroplex area. Um, in regards to uh, you know, what I do, obviously, like uh, Vance said, I do uh, the residential home loans, and I get pretty aggressive on that. And discussing uh, ICE, uh, I'd just like to footnote that in that process, it's short, mid, and long term goals that are set. So if I know mm -hmm. we know somebody that is ready to go, yes, we're going we're gonna to definitely you know, formulate a plan and get them to from point A to point Z, uh, you know, within a, within, a, within a prescribed period of time. Uh, Midterm, uh, they may be a little bit of work. Long term, it may take a little bit longer. But these are assets in, in, uh, that I think is important, more than worth more than money, and that's people. And so I look at it that way. So as long as we keep those people in our pipeline, as Vance mentioned, uh, this becomes a gold mine. Understanding how ice works. Yeah, well, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, essentially knowing what this means and knowing how to apply it, especially the questions that we're going to ask our clients, uh, will certainly help all that underwriting time period and, and help people's time efficiently know if this is something that they should dig down deeper as a client or if they need to move, or as an agent, we need to move on to something else more important, more, more urgent. Um, so let's let's go over just real quick, what, what does ICE stand for? You bet, I look at ICE, when, when you look at the acronym of ICE, uh, it stands for income, C for credit, and E for equity if you're doing a refinance, or just switch that E and think about it as assets in your conversation. Cash. <laughs> yeah, exactly. or, yeah, as much cash as they yeah, got. As much cash as you got. Well, sweet. So, you know, honestly, uh, uh, go, go through each one of those acronyms and just kind of explain, you know, from a lender standpoint, you know, obviously, what, what y'all are going to be looking for. You bet. You bet. Uh, what I like to do, Ben, a lot of times when I'm talking to the consumer out there, I take away that connotation of an application because it sounds like as if it's a mundane, you know, process I have to go through and you have to undress me financially and ask me this and that. And so a lot of times when I'm looking at um, the consumer up front and even, uh, you know, my colleagues in the, on, on the real estate side, uh, it helps them as well because you're kind of gauging up front what kind of consumer you have. And a lot of times I have a saying that you cannot measure what you can't see. And <laughs> yeah, you don't have, they, they don't come to you with W-2s and paycheck stubs, nor do they when they contact me over the phone. So I have to visually prepare them you know, up front that, uh, that when they go through a process of doing a mortgage, kind of leapfrogging real quick, they do sign a document saying that they are responsible for any information that, that they provide that has to be correct and current and otherwise they're, they're, they are purging uh, themselves. So, you know, we let them know that too, that we need that information up front to benefit them, really. Right. So when I talk about income, I'm, I'm, it's really twofold. I ask them about what kind of, uh, uh, in their income, what kind of employment uh, are they involved? What's their, what's their profession? And in that conversation, where I sit at least, it may not be for you, the realtor or the investor, but when I'm sitting down with an individual, I have a legal pad and a pen, and I'm jotting down in the conversation, uh, ask about their employment, their, their history, they say, oh my, uh, you know, I work for the city, great, what, what's that profession? And we start talking about that. And through that conversation, they start spilling out how much income they make without 
again, it's not like as if I'm going through an interrogation with them. Right. And so that income portion of it, they tell me about how much they're making, and I, then I, we ask, are you W-2 salary, hourly, self-employed, are you temporarily working? Those are the simple questions I ask up front that can determine whether or not you know we can even go forward. Just recently, I had an individual tell me they had everything else under ice, with the exception of he's getting ready to start his self-employment business next month. Oh, wow. So yeah, at, in our industry, we need two years now. Right. So right off the bat, I need to be, you know, he stays at me too for a while, you right. know, and wait, wait till you, uh, you want to make that jump, and then, but do it now while you have that W-2 income. Absolutely. And, and asking those questions up front, I, I didn't go through the whole process. I mean, what a lot of folks end up doing is they take an application 30 minutes into it, realizing they should ask that question up front. Right. Yeah, of course. And that kind of makes the client upset if they've gone through all this underwriting and applications and stuff like that without actually knowing if they're going to be close enough to even qualify. So that kind of makes your clients a little more happy too, or potential clients, because now they're not wasting, feel like they're wasting as much time. Um, and two, I, I wanted to touch a little bit more on income too, about, you know, obviously the self-employment uh, side of things, because, um, you know, obviously being that most of us are real estate agents or real estate investors, you know, if we want to use you to buy our own house, you know, we're all self-employed, we're not W-2 income, of course. Um, what are what are kind of the you know uh, guidelines, restrictions, things that y'all look for, questions that y'all ask whenever it comes to self-employment? That's a very good question too, Vincent, that, that you do ask. And a lot of times when somebody does tell me, hey, Angelo, you know, I'm temporarily working or I'm self-employed, you know, especially self-employed, I'll ask, are you 1099? Uh, or, you know, did you just start, are you proprietary, are you a K-1? You know, there's, there's all these little things that we look at. The first thing that I ask when they are self-employed, then I'll ask them uh, over the phone if, and usually, the way I work is that over the phone, I'll ask them if they can go grab their documents. And if I can hear that paper over the phone, then we're, now we're talking off the same sheet of music. And typically, Vance, well, I'll ask, what, I, what I will ask them on their tax returns is that look at an item, I believe, 37 on the front page. That will tell me what the adjusted gross income is. Then I can always go back and add any depreciation and depletions if need be. Gotcha. So adjusted gross income is really what y'all are going, going off of. And... And you know, you need two years of tax returns at least for self-employment. Um, is there any is there any way to get around that as far as like if someone was self-employed, um, some way of showing maybe like more this may skip it over a little bit, maybe more equity or assets or a, a combination of that? Because I know that a lot of our you know viewers, of course, a lot of our agents or investors, we may have um, a lot of equity in the in the bank, or we may have some some assets or net worth that we can show, but maybe not a lot on our taxes, and so. You know, is there a combination of those two that you can use? Yeah, you know, the beauty of the beauty of what uh, used to happen back in the industry, as you're aware of, is that stated income, no income, no asset program. I mean, you can tell somebody that they worked at Denny's and they were a chef making five grand a month. And <laughs> that was done. That was a path of least resistance. Oh, sure. Uh, so today, uh, without looking at, and those tax returns, by the way, is, I mean, that's pretty much on self-employment. They're looking at those, those last two years of those tax returns. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of times, too, in those tax returns, when we're looking at that, um, um, you know, we're looking at, and I wanted to footnote that too, is that um, when I'm looking at the income, I'm looking at no more than 30% of that income should go towards the housing payment. Okay. So that makes yeah, sense. Make, yeah. make, make, make that a footnote of that. So, uh, and, and I, I didn't want to break, that, break that, train of, that, that train of thought there because I wanted to bring that up as a keynote because up front, if they tell me, Angela, I'm making five grand gross a month, I'm W2. Mm -hmm. That's five grand, five, five K gross a month, and I break it down between uh, your overtime and commissions, and I'll go over that in, in, in a minute. But just what your what your regular, uh, uh, in this case, let's say it's five thousand a month salary gross. I say okay, then you can't exceed no more than thirty percent of that, or fifteen hundred fifteen hundred bucks in a monthly mortgage payment, which puts you about a two hundred thousand dollars purchase price. Right. That's just me thinking up front because I, I do this on a daily basis. Well, well, personally, you know, you would, you would want to be around that target, not debt to income, but of course, what your total monthly payment for the mortgage is compared to that adjusted. Adjusted gross income. Correct. Cool. Correct. Correct. So that's so that's exactly what I'd be looking at there. And so you know, getting back on the uh, what I'd be looking at on those tax returns for self-employed individuals, there are programs out there that they can get into what they call bank statements, and that's using assets from your from either your personal or business bank statements, or a combination of both. Okay. And so what they'd, they'd be looking at their bank would be your ending balance on those returns. Now, some lenders may or may not, depending, as you mentioned earlier, lenders have what they call overlays, which makes the process a lot more difficult because then that lender can make a decision or a, 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 add an additional uh, uh, condition to how they underwrite uh, files. But what mm -hmm. we look at, we're pretty 
pretty open about that. So there's hardly any overlays. But one of the things to look at would be uh, if they look at your tax or your your, your bank statements. Uh, if there are a lot of NSFs, that can that can raise an issue. Gotcha. So if you're having that discussion about bank statements, oh by the way, you know without yeah, it's a, in a general term, you know they are looking at NSFs. Any chances of those kind of things? They, do they look at that too on an annual basis? I mean, like full twelve months of bank statements? Uh, they, no, they, just two. They they, um, they will absolutely. That's why, and yeah. when it comes to the bank statement, I rather take the path of least resistance because there's a twelve and or twenty four month bank statements. Mm -hmm. How to look at that is if you do a twelve month bank statement program, typically you're showing less, rates gonna be higher. Right. Sorry, one month bank statement, you expose it more. Rates gonna be a little easier. Little bit gotcha. So yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of variables, of course, with oh, sure. loans. Sure. Course, there's always these different, you know, right, the right seat for the right butt, pretty much. <laughs> so you gotta figure out which way to go, which which process to take. Um, Absolutely. Before we get into the last segment, which I'm gonna talk about is, you know, questions that real estate agents should ask. But as far as credit goes, what what is credit usually range from? Well, typically, that's a good question people will ask me. They'll say, Angela, you know, I've gotten my credit pulled by, you know, those folks of the world, the karmas and uh, um, the freecreditreports.com, which are very good programs to go off of. That's a good mm -hmm. starting point. Um, just not to, not to go into really deep into how credit reports work, but I've had the uh, luxury of, uh, at one point, in time, uh, one point in time in my career to have three different field agents from Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion describe how they score their, their, their scoring models. And surprise, surprise, mm -hmm. they, all have this, they all have three different three the scoring models, three different types of DNAs, that's why we have three different uh, credit scores. So when we're looking at scoring, de de depending on the programs, on government loans, you can go down to as low as a middle, a middle credit score, regardless of the bureau, Experian, mm -hmm. Equifax, TransUnion, that middle score with 580 or above in most cases. On uh, a conventional loan, you want to get those better rates, you better have a 740 bit score. So typically that's what we're looking at in, in the market as well. Everything is credit score driven, but a lot of times credits can be misconstrued. Somebody can tell you, hey Angela, I have a 580 middle score, I have no derogatory credit, but the reason why my scores are so low is because I'm utilizing a lot of my credit, which can drive your score down. In the eyes of the underwriter, hey, you're not a bad, you're not totally a bad credit risk, you just overextend on credit. That's Whereas you get a five-week score guy, he's all over the place with derogatory credit. I'm going to lend you guys. If I have my poison, I'd rather pick the guy that. Is so okay, so one. so just to make this clear, you know, it is obviously score matters. The number that is on there matters. And to hit that certain score, correct. To hit the you know the the ability to apply and actually be proved, but it also they also take into consideration what that credit is deemed for. So correct. Past, you know, past I'm sure judgments or. Money's owed, or banks that are owed, or you know, just having a lot of debt to income is probably not the best thing in the world. But obviously, is that's why I looked at less hardly than than something derogatory in that sense on the credit score. Spot on, so. and, and you're right. And they're looking at those trade lines too, and that gives mm -hmm. you a history how how they are able to to uh, you know determine their, their their pattern of not how they spend, but how they borrow as well. Gotcha. So, you know, you have to start a barometer and take a look at that history. So for you, if we're looking at a credit report at my office and I expose it to you, you can actually say, okay, I see how my pattern looks like over the last 12 months. It looks spotless. Wow. But what happened to the 580 score? Well, you know, I extended myself out. Isolated incident, I had medical issues, I had to extend my credit out. But you look at my history prior to that, it's been spot on. That's how I approach it to an underwriter as opposed to gotcha. putting a file out there and hope for osmosis that the underwriter says, okay, I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. No, a lot of times if you get the right person to set that story straight, uh, I'm telling you, the underwriter is a judge and jury. I'm your attorney. I'm <laughs> oh, your attorney yeah. to take you well, straight to. I was about to say, a great analogy for that would be yeah. the attorney yeah. Yeah, judge relationship. Absolutely. The judge is the underwriter. They're going to make that final judgment of yay or nay. They're going to be the one fighting on behalf of the client. And so, trust me, not every underwriter thinks the same way. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. they're all, well, they're all different. Of course, whoever you work with, obviously, is going to have different underwriters as well. You wouldn't want me for an underwriter. I have a career Oh, man. No kidding. Uh, well, the, guys, we're going to, at the tail end of our, of our training, I'm going to talk a little bit about the questions that agents should ask their clients. So, obviously, I think if they, if, if, if our agents, you know, if one of your key items is to talk about ICE and to kind of mention ICE to their potential clients, do you think, is that probably the best approach? To kind of underwrite them before we send them over to you. It it really it really is. In fact, you don't even, you know, you can mention ICE to them and say how you know for example, Mr. Consumer, uh, in determining how I can qualify you for a mortgage. I usually use the analogy of ICE, and let me explain to you how that works. And I say this to my youngest sister, who's a school teacher. So she kind of 
things like I do in structure. You know, it's like income, credit, and equity. You go, oh, okay, so they follow along. Right. And without having to, you know, go through a, 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 a formal application, mm -hmm. we just have an informal conversation about what I look at and here are the, the main the, the three main components that really drives those factors whether or not you're getting right. get approved for mortgage or not. So just to have a simple conversation about income and credit and all that, you're right. I mean that can I mean by that time you've got a you've got you've got they're churning like a bird. You've got all this information in front of you without you asking all these questions. Right, and right. And that, that's like the biggest thing too is making it simplify and easy for us to say, you know, not go through each part of that and go, hey, what's your income look like? What kind of job do you have? What is W-2? Is it 1099? But just to say, ICE, here's the income, credit, equity that most lenders, and even if it's not you, most lenders are going to take into consideration. So that's a great kind of underwriting way, at least a topic to get things started. So I, I, I would imagine, you know, that way it's it is. simple, sweet, straightforward to the point. Well, and the reason why I use it a lot too in my approach Advanced with you know most consumers, not all. Regardless, is you know I'll tell them, hey, this is how ICE works for me. Do you have any issues regarding any of this of this stuff? I want to go ahead and eliminate yeah. any of those barriers up front. Because if I know everything else is smooth, I don't. <clears throat> excuse me, I don't need to go back and reinvent the wheel with what I already know. You know, yeah. the fear of the unknown. A lot of times, the consumer won't let you know from what's happening. It's going to be exposed regardless, anyways. If, okay. if there's a case, let's, let's let's overcome that now. Gotcha. Yeah, which totally makes sense. I mean, it's. Very catch you sooner than later. Oh, that is, yeah. Not thug you down the line and have some makeup well, problem. Well, the last thing I want to have is what's coming back to me saying, Angela, how come you didn't tell me about this? Well, the customer didn't tell me about this until it surfaced out of a title search from four years ago on the property or something in nature. Yes. Which can happen, you know. So, right. you know, in our, in, in, our, in our jobs, we're information gathering. Right, right. Yeah, and of course, you know, we can't, we're not the wizards of everything, but, you know, obviously there's some, uh, some people out there that don't tell the full honest truth up front ends up hurting everyone. So. Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately. But, uh, well, guys, uh, well, thank you guys for, for uh, tuning in and viewing one of our trainings on, you know, ICE, obviously being able to work with Angelo here on with uh, Leader One Financial to be able to do our loans and help us with our retail clients. Uh, guys, if, if you don't know Angelo, uh, Angelo, how is the best way to get in contact with you? Uh, locally here in the Metroplex, Dallas, Fort Worth, 214-642-1293. That is my mobile. Uh, available 24-8 and the other one is my email address which is which is Angelo Falto F-A-L-T-O at leader the number one dot com awesome man I appreciate it thank you for coming man, in my pleasure. training for us man. Rock roll. awesome I definitely appreciate it sure, my pleasure. and uh, you know, reformers uh, stay tuned uh, this Thursday we're going to be doing our webinar uh, if you guys have any questions or information or would like to get in touch with Angelo but maybe uh, didn't hear what he said <laughs> even though it's at the bottom of the screen uh, please give us a shout at 817-986-0911 or uh, shoot us an email on our website. Appreciate it, guys. Thank Thanks. you. Have a good one.